This is Sam Katz with Gallery Glass, and I'm in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, at the studio space of Thomas Stevenson. Um, I don't know how wide your shot is, so I'll kind of I'll step over this way and let you look around. Great. We've got kind of three projects that you can see in the space right now. I'm very interested in whatever's in front of me. Do we want to start there? Sure. Yeah. Take so this is a, as you can see. It's a tent. It's a campus tent. It's part of a project called uh, Bivouac. The tent um, is uh, part of a rooftop campsite project. And the pro uh, rooftop campsite project, the, um, the project has been on various roofs uh, in North Brooklyn over the last two years. It's uh, been everywhere from over by the Morgan Stop to by the Grand Stop. There are seven of these tents. Six of them are for campers, and uh, one of them is for myself. The project runs generally from anywhere from two to four nights in a row, and the campers come after their work, and they spend their domestic hours at the campsite. So after work at in the office, people come with their food and their sleeping bags or whatever they want to sleep on, whether it's sheets, blankets, whatever, bring some food to share with the group. The group and the campers come together at about six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Everyone has a meal, they share the meal. People go to bed about 10, 10.30. Everyone gets up around eight and you go back to work. So the piece isn't necessarily sculpture, it's more of an interactive piece. Yeah, I mean, I, I euphemistically call it a social sculpture. I mean, it's a, obviously a sculptural object. I made it, but you know, without an audience, without participants, it's incredibly inert and uninteresting to me. Uh, you know, it's a nice thing. You may or may not be attractive, but it takes that synergy with having people come camping and it finishes it up. Did you work with certain institutions to um, uh, to promote the project or to um, house the project? Not at all. Uh, it's all been. Uh, all the participants have been word of mouth. Uh, so friends of friends, people, there's a website for it. On the website, you can sign out a tent on the various nights. And uh, mostly people have been really generous and people have been really generous and have uh, donated roofs. So people have said like, oh, my building, my landlord will let you use their roof. And so we've gone over, you know, over by the Morgan stop, we'll use a couple of roofs over there. Over by the Grand Stop, we've used some roofs, so it's been really nice that people have just been generous in letting us use their spaces. And it's an ongoing project. People can still use the tents. We can still access them. Totally. The project's ongoing. I mean, it, for me, the project's kind of never-ending, right? I mean, I have, the tents are built. There's no reason not to continue the project. As long as people are generous enough in helping me find locations, then the project will continue. I mean, it's, there's nothing to prevent it from continuing. That's exciting. Great. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. This is a uh, well, chandelier in its basic form. Um, you're welcome to step up that ladder and take a look at it from above. Give you a better view of the space. The space. Can you walk me through this piece? Sure. Um, currently, you're looking at it in its uh, stationary state. It's part of a it's part of a larger performance in which there is a character who, when it's a more, it's not a. Uh, I'm gonna back up. So. It's a not a live performance. It's a performance for video whereby a character will jump from one side of the frame onto this larger uh, onto this larger bar, swing back and forth and back and forth, and then release over here. So it makes this nice diagonal. It's incredibly structurally sound. Oh yeah, it is 
is very structurally sound. Obviously, that light bulb is going to break when you hit a jump. I mean, that's, but that's okay. It's not, that's part of the plan. Does the piece require a participant to to allow the, the, the mission to be fulfilled? No, no, I think it, originally yes, but then once it was completed, I just enjoyed looking at it, you know, as a, as a sculptural object, it was fulfilling in and of itself. So the formative part is really for my, for me to finish the project, for me, yeah, for me to finish the conceptual part of the project. Can I assume there is only one of these? There are only one of these. That is true. So is it available for purchase? Of course. Of course it is. I see that you work with um, several several mediums here. You're obviously dabbling with technology and, like you said, performance. Is that typical for your for your um, artistry? Yeah, totally. Um, I find that the engagement of the popular... Uh, Engagement of the, of the public, engagement of the public is important to me. This is not, this piece personally doesn't actually have a public engagement. The Bivouac project, the, the tent project, and the project over there, the Disco Transformer project, both have public participation. In them. This one is a kind of loathe to say this traditional performative. One person, one camera. I'm performing for the camera or the audience, whichever. Can we take a look at the disco project? Sure. I'm going to stop. So this is a disco transformer. Um, it looks like a large food cart. You know, uh, it has Of the... I like all my meals with a little bit of disco. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, myself and a few friends, it's designed to be moved, and so that's what these four points are. It kind of lives down in public space, it lives on streets, and so it's performed kind of between neighborhoods. So, there's music, there's a full sound system inside of it, kind of like an over glorified car stereo, like a very loud car, car stereo. And so it's this loud food cart playing music. You're like, okay, that's interesting. And as it moves kind of through the landscape, we slowly start opening it up. And I really do believe that the dialogue with the larger population is super important. I mean, the two of the three pieces I showed that we went over, they're, they're public. I mean, you go to a website, you can sign up for the next time I'm camping on a roof. I don't say, oh, do you understand the discursive thing about, you know, the discursive parts of the project in regards to, you know, privacy and, you know, uh, say the word, you know, uh, privacy and democracy. Do it's not mentioned on the website at all. It's not even, it's only mentioned in my head or when I have private conversations about it. It's a campsite on a roof. On one level, on the base level, I have a campsite on a roof. And the next question is, why do I have a campsite on the roof? We can go into that conversation, but for it to be enjoyable and participatory for the audience, that second part isn't necessary. And I don't want to start with the second part first because all of a sudden it starts like, starts quickly sounds like bullshit art speed. It's like, oh, these are the discursive reasons why I do my practice, my practice. And it's like, all of a sudden I'm like, I'm trying to alienate people, you know, as so like Max Weber said in like 1860 or 1890, you know, there's a power of language that can be incredibly intimidating. And it's so intimidating, it prevents people from entering the conversation. Like, I, I can't go to this crazy, you know, pro-democracy, privacy camp, camp encampment thing it's like what the hell is that like, it's campsite on roof dude that's what it is it's right here are there multiple levels of course let's hope everybody's idea has multiple levels to it. so so accessibility really comes into play when you when you think out your projects though yes of course it's in my head yeah but it's not it's never written down on a piece of paper it's you know 
I think there's a high value on it because so many people, like I was, I was saying, so many people find art intimidating or don't really understand it, so they're afraid to approach it. What's interesting about about you, and I think most people would be interested to know, is that you have a, a background and um, educational training in philosophy. How does that play into the work that you create? It's my pleasure. Reading is our philosophical texts. I mean, this is you know. My, you know, I may watch bad Hollywood movies for entertainment. My reading is, you know, our philosophy text, and they tend to be, you know, 1970s on till, you know, pre-Socratic philosophy. So it's, you know, it's a really big range of things that have kind of been filtered through my head over the last, you know, 20 plus years, and they're there, and you know. But in my practice, they're the underlying part, you know. First, I have to make it accessible, make it fun, like, oh, or make it accessible, sorry. And if it happens to be fun, that's really great. You know, we have a machine that plays fun music going down the street. Great. And we have gone through neighborhoods, I've gone through neighborhoods, and people are like, this is awesome. And kids have come up and started joining us. And I say kids, I mean teenagers, you know. And they're like, you're playing Donna Summer. My mom used to play Donna Summer when I was growing up. It's kind of interesting. And they're, and they start, they come with us and they follow us. And for me, that's great. I mean, that's what I, that's what I desire to have happen. That people just kind of, it acts as an aggregator. People are just kind of magnetized and pulled together using, you know, these cues of light and sound. But then the next step of it is like. What, we, what am I doing, you know, creating community? Where am I creating, creating community? On the streets, in public space, you know? So it's like, which are the kind of the basic building blocks of society, right? Like we're building community. We're, you're choosing to participate. You're choosing to participate. Just because I've given you these small cues, some, night, some bright lights, a shiny object, and some sound. And then people choose to come together and everyone has a good time. So the work really is layered in that sense. Um, you know, obviously there's that ph philosophical meaning for you, but in a greater sense for anybody who interacts with your work, which begs the question, who inspires you, your work? Everything from, you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers, you know, through, you know, whatever I read last week, I mean, uh, so philosophy, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, philosophy but, already, uh, you know, com comes into play when you're thinking out your projects. But, no, but what about my, just my daily reading? I mean, like, you yeah. know, my favorite part of the newspaper, the two favorite parts of the newspaper every day are the business and politics section of the newspaper. I read those in multiple newspapers every day. I need to know what's going on in the world. I read the, the front page of the Times, the front page of the Journal. Read all those articles. It's kind of knowing the world we live in. We're people, we live in a space, we share things. People higher power than us make decisions that affect our lives. We as a group, how do we interact with them? So I do these small projects that say, why can't we camp on a roof? Why can't we commune together and make our own decisions of how we're gonna eat? All I say to people when they get invited to camp, it's like, bring some food to share. What does that mean? I'm like, well, we don't have fire, so, and it's, it's warm weather, so cold food's good. I have no idea what anyone's going to bring. We could all be starving for the night. But I kind of believe that, I believe that people get it. And people self-select. Kind of going back to my example of the kids who choose to join up with, you know, when we're going down the street or whoever decides to join up, like self-select, like, oh, that's interesting. And they come together. Philosopher, artist, storyteller, all around Renaissance man, thank you for speaking with me today. This is Sam Katz from Gallery Glass. Now give us a kiss. Thank <laughs> you.